Welcome back to Court TV Live, your front row seat to justice. I'm Julie Grant. We're following a status hearing currently underway in Statesboro, Georgia, against defendant Marcus Wilson. So he was arrested and accused of the death of Haley Hutchinson back in 2020. And at issue during this three day long stand your ground hearing, uh, the defendant is asking for immunity from the court, claiming that he was standing his ground when he fired five shots at a vehicle that he alleges was trying to run him and his girlfriend off the road. Now, so you understand what's going on here, a court order is prohibiting court TV from showing you what is happening in court until court concludes for the day. So if you've been watching closing arguments at night, you may have seen some of this on Vinny's show. Um, and of course, we've been in the Hankinson trial in Kentucky, uh, so we haven't been able to show it here. So what we want to do today uh, during the next three hours, really take a deep dive and show you all of the important key testimony in this hearing, because in real time, both sides just wrapped up their closing arguments. And we expect the court to have a decision possibly by 1 p.m. Eastern time and we have our crew in the courtroom so we are there watching it but just so you understand we can't broadcast it live so what we're going to do now is go back to the beginning so sit back let's watch and take a look at what the prosecution and wilson's defense team presented to the court on day number one is what we believe the fact show that in the early morning of june the 14th 2020 there were five young adults mason edward gleason Henry Conley, Marcy Elizabeth Navy, Haley L. Hutchison, and Ashton Robert Deloach. They were traveling together in one pickup truck. It was a, a Chevy Silverado. It was elevated. It had a lift kit. It had large tires. It was old and ragged. They had party in Claxton earlier, going to various Places they had come to Statesboro, continued to party. Before heading back to Claxton, they stopped to use the bathroom at Parker's on Brandon Avenue in Statesboro. And while at Parker's, and this is so important, the evidence will show they saw two Claxton High School students that they knew to be Mary Jane Swanson and Michaela McCain. You're going to hear from them. The party admitted to seeing Swanson and her friends leave Parker's. However, the party of teenagers did not speak to Swanson and her friends, and there's a reason they didn't. Because they were there with, with black guys. Wilson and Rigdon pulled up at the traffic light where the party, Chevy, Silverado, black truck, was waiting for the light to change. The party saw the sedan driven by Wilson pull up next to them, and they immediately mis mistook Rigdon, you're going to see Mary Jane Swanson and Emma Rigdon. Watch when they come in this courtroom. They mistook Emma Rigdon, who was in the passenger seat of Marcus Wilson's car, for Mary Jane Swanson, who was with the black guy earlier, the party, in the Silverado, again, hanging out the window and yelling racist remarks, calling Wilson, who they thought was Mary Jane Swanson's boyfriend, and continue in the same taunts they began at the gas station. Your lives don't matter. Instead of backing off, they continue to swerve closer and closer towards Wilson's sedan while threatening. And then, then the party began to throw what they admit were objects at Wilson's sedan, beer cans. Fearing for Rickman's life, fearing for his own life, Wilson made, God forbid, we ever are in that position to have to make the split second decision to fire shots. As we all know, unbeknownst to both Wilson and Regan, during that second sh set of shots, one of those bullets may have entered the vehicle and may have struck Bailey Hutchison in the back of the head. A reasonable person standing in Mark Wilson's shoes that night believed, would, could reasonably believe that their life was in danger. And Your Honor, that's what we're going to show in this show that by more than a month or so, but at least until a month or so, we'd ask that you would uh, grant immunity and forbid the prosecution of Mark Wilson for the offenses of that So what Mr. Johnson has just done is given the court a narrative of what he believes the facts are in this case as of today. Um, the narrative has changed in this case multiple times. One of the most important things 
that came out of that interview that is part of the actual facts is that Emma never heard one single racial slur uttered. But the tragedy of that night is that Haley ended up dead. And she ended up dead at the hands of Mark Wilson because he fired a gun not once, not twice, but multiple times. And he shot her in the back of the head. And that, that's how she spent her last minutes while her friends did take her to the hospital here in Statesbury. Part of the actual facts in this case that are going to come out throughout the next couple of days are that Mr. Wilson didn't call the police. He didn't call any of his family that lives locally who he had been at their home just a couple of hours earlier, one of whom is in law enforcement. We believe that the actual facts, Your Honor, are going to be going out over the next few days, and we believe after the court hears the actual facts that there will be evidence before the court that would be sufficient so that the court could deny this motion for any of you so that this case could move forward to a trial. All right, so that was a little glimpse of... The arguments that both sides made to the court before any evidence was presented. Let me bring in criminal defense attorney Joe Tamburino for some analysis. Joe, what'd you think of what both sides presented, please? They both had strong points. From the defense, they basically had the racial animus going from the beginning. And from the prosecution, they clearly used Emma Rigdon's statement. That's gonna be crucial in this, that she didn't hear any of these words. Joe, what about the fact that the prosecutor told the court how Haley Hutchison was shot in the back of the head? So we know she was seated, uh, seated excuse me, in the middle of that uh, back seat of the car. And we have a graphic I want to put up on the screen so we can all get a, kind of a look, an overhead look as to where she was sitting. So um, you see, obviously, that car, that truck was full, you know, the driver front seat passenger and then three passengers in the back with Haley Hutchison, uh, the young woman who was killed in, in the back middle there. So shot in the back of the head. So again, we haven't heard any evidence, but that would tell me Marcus Wilson was behind the truck at that point in order to be able to fire uh, at that shot. Doesn't take a firearms expert to um, figure out that. What do you think that says about things? If he's saying he's trying to be run off the road, um, does that help the prosecution's argument? What do you think, Joe? It greatly helps the prosecution's argument because regardless of the law, whether it's in Georgia, Florida, New York, and Georgia has this, there's reasonableness, meaning that you have to act reasonably, even when you're using self-defense. Therefore, if this truck was moving away from Mr. Uh, Wilson, if it was going away from him, no longer a threat, and then he fired, that's going to be very problematic for the defense, very problematic. Yeah, uh, boy, oh boy, this, this case is really something. I mean, when you think about it, uh, like all those, so that car was full, all those uh, teenagers in that car um, who allegedly were trying to run Marcus Wilson off the road um, witnessed their, their friend, um, being shot in the back of the head. Uh, my goodness, uh, the trauma. When you think about these cases, and I know we've talked about this before, but um, now's as good a time as any to, to deep dive into it more with you, Joe. You, you've been a prosecutor. You know what it's like working with victims. And um, here, I mean, all of those lives were changed, uh, not just the lives of those who love Haley Hutchison and will never get her back, but those two teens sitting right next to her. I mean, the, the proximity. Um, it, I mean, it's astounding. More people weren't killed. I mean, five shots uh, went off there. Um, what do you? What can you share with us about how, in criminal cases, you know, we get so focused on the evidence and just what's happening in court. We don't get the look how how people are coping with things, you know, throughout their lives. And when you you see witnesses on a case, oftentimes they've experienced trauma too. Um, harkening back a, a, really upon the time you spent as a prosecutor, Joe, um, what have you learned about how these cases change things for people? Well, it's throughout even the years. I've been doing this a little over 32 years and the human drama of criminal court is is amazing. I mean, it, it just goes so deep. And you're right, all of these people's lives are forever affected. I was even surprised in this case that the driver had the wherewithal to drive all the way to the hospital. I mean, when you think about it, you're getting shot at, your friend in the back is fatally shot, 
I'm sure there's blood, screaming, everything, and you have the presence of mind to actually drive to the hospital. Um, it's a complete tragedy all the way around. And with, with criminal cases, what's interesting is that Criminal cases look back in time, meaning that when we get it in the courtroom or at a hearing, we have to look back and reconstruct everything. And when we do that, sometimes people, when they testify, will actually bring us back in time as to how it felt, what was going on, the raw emotions, and it's quite moving. Oh, it sure is. And I know you're well aware of this, and I feel like I can't stress it enough. Said it before on the show, I'll say it again. Victims advocates are wonderful people and oftentimes kind of like the unsung heroes in court cases because we don't see them, we don't hear from them, they're not part of it. Um, and they weren't part of the incident that we're looking back at, to your point, Joe, but then they become part of the process going forward and literally hold the hands of people involved. Um, sometimes even, you know, witnesses who've, you know, felt the trauma and have to go back in court and share the trauma. Uh, so can't say enough uh, great things about those folks who commit their time uh, to doing that.